to the Ocean International Community Church. Now, today is the beginning of a brand new series called uh, Running with the Giants. And in this series, we'll basically look at some of the heroes of faith. Uh, Hebrews 11.3 says, you know, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And basically, we'll just read through and see basically four, we'll focus on four heroes of faith and how they live their lives and what we can learn from them and how will that impact our life to live for the glory of God. Let's pray. King Jesus, we come before you this morning. We say thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness. We say thank you because we know that even today, Lord Jesus, you are with us. I say thank you for giving me the opportunity and the honor to be a part of this grand moment that's happening in the ocean this morning, God. I come before you and I commit myself into your hands and I pray that you would use me as a vessel to speak your word. I commit everybody else into your hands and I pray that their hearts be conditioned to receive what you have for them this morning. I pray that you would speak to their needs and at the end of the day, God, they would be transformed and live lives that glorify you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, church, um, the more I actually read the Bible, the more I realize that God didn't suddenly become more loving when Jesus showed up and died on the cross and rose up again. Because sometimes there is a temptation to think that, you know what, God was mean in the Old Testament and suddenly when Jesus showed up, he was this nice, coving, I mean, kind, loving God. But God was loving all along, and the more I read the Old Testament, the more I realize that God was truly loving, because the Old Testament is filled with some of the most filthy, rotten, sinful, perverted people. I mean, if we were to humanly measure, with a human broken scale, okay, how we people sometimes like to judge others, and this is not so bad, and this is really bad. Like how some of us think, you know what, it's better to be a liar than to be gay. Or you know what, it's good to cheat than to kill somebody, okay? If we were to measure based on that broken human scale, some of these guys are worse than some of you guys. Like some of you guys are really way better than some of these guys. And to prove my point, let's just take a look at some of these guys, okay? You have Jacob. Jacob was a corn artist. He conned everybody in his life. Like he is a guy you don't want to be around. He conned his own father, you know, his brother, his father-in-law, he was so bad. And then God chose him to establish his nation. What's that about? And then you have the children of Jacob. It's like it gets worse by the generation. His kids were so jacked up, two of his sons had anger management issues. One time, some rich kid raped their sister, and they decided to slaughter the entire town. And then God chose one of these guys to establish the priestly office, Levi which is a pretty big deal because it foreshadows the ministry of Jesus. He is our great high priest. And then you have another one of his sons. His name was Judah. I think he's the most famous out of the bunch. When we call Jesus the king of Judah, basically we're saying Jesus is the king of the children of this particular guy. Now, Judah didn't mind paying for prostitutes. If he was alive today, you would find him in the strip club. And he paid top dollar. And then you have his oldest son, Reuben, who was such a thirsty guy at one point, he was so thirsty, he raped his stepmom. It is so bad. And then the Bible tells us that the new Jerusalem in all its glory and splendor has the gates of that particular city, city of gold. He's named after one, these guys, basically. So I don't know what you did this morning. I don't know what you did last night or this past week. It's nothing God can forgive. If God loved these guys, his grace covers everything. So Relax. Relax. But in all this craziness, one guy stands out. He was different from everybody else around him. There is no record of him sinning in the Bible. And I'm pretty sure this was intentional. Not to portray him as perfect, because he wasn't. He sinned. But to portray God as true and faithful. And as I was getting ready for this message, I kept wondering, what did this guy know? I mean, what did he know that led him to live such a tremendous and consistent life? What did he know compared to everybody else around him that led him to live that kind of life? And the result was mind-blowing. But before we get to that, I want us to look at his life, to paint a picture. Now, we first hear about Joseph when he is born in Genesis 30, 24. Now, he, his father was jacked up Jacob. His mom was pretty girl Rachel. He was the 11th child of Jacob. And his father loved him more than any of his other children. In fact, he chose not to hide, which is a vile mistake. And then Joseph grows up. He turns 17. When he is 17 years old, 
he starts having these dreams that is going to be a big shot. And his brothers will serve him. So he's excited. He tells his brothers. His brothers don't take this very well. So that plus him being the favorite child, it fuels bitterness, anger, and jealousy of his brothers. But Joseph being Joseph, he, he continues to you know, live his life. And then he has another dream. And this time around, his brothers and his parents will serve him. Even Jacob takes it a different way this time around. He's like, hold up, boy. But then the Bible says that Jacob ponders in his heart. Partly because I'm sure he knew, as his children knew, God's promises to Abraham. Could it be that Joseph is the one who will carry the promise forward? Anyways, days pass by, and then one day, his ten brothers travel a long distance to go take care and feed the flock. So after a while, his dad says, you know what, Joseph, why don't you go and check out your brothers and see what they're up to and see if the flock is okay? You know, partly because Joseph is a man of integrity. He can be trusted. So, you know, Joseph travels all the way to Shechem, and then he gets there. His brothers are not there. Somebody tells him, like, you know, your, bo your brothers are all the way to Dothan. So, you know, he travels all that way. And when he's a distance away, his brothers see him. And they start talking amongst themselves. Like, you know, you look at that dreamer, you know, looking all fly with that Gucci jacket that our daddy made him. So he gets there. They take him. They put him in a pit. And they're discussing, like, okay, so what do we do now? Because he's a thorn in our flesh. So, you know, they start talking, okay, let's kill him. And then Judah says, I don't think that's a good idea. We don't want that kind of a paranormal, act paranormal activity chasing us. So, you know, they say, you know what? Let's sell him as a slave all the way to Egypt. So they sell him as a slave to the passing Midianites. Now, Joseph is on his way to Egypt as a slave. So imagine being Joseph. So young, passionate about God, with these grand visions and grand promises from God, from your great-grandfather chasing you down. And all those promises and visions concerned the promised land, his homeland. And here you are being carried away, away from the promise, away from home, into a foreign land. How bad is that? So he gets to Egypt, he gets sold to this big shot named Potiphar. And he just went from being a favorite child to being a slave. I mean, he went from 100 to negative 100 real quick. But then, something weird happens. Because it doesn't seem like Joseph is taking this personally. Let's, let's read, okay? Turn your Bibles to Genesis 39, verse 2. Let's see what the Bible says. Genesis 39, verse 2. This is the ESV translation. The Bible says, The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. I mean, maybe it's just me, but this kind of sounds crazy. Because it sounds like Joseph is doing way better than he did back home. Because this is the first time the Bible calls Joseph a successful man, which is pretty ironic considering he's a slave. And see, church, sometimes we have to change our idea of success. Because Joseph was a slave who owned absolutely nothing, not even his own freedom, but the Bible calls him a successful man. Sometimes success could simply be you being used as a vessel to advance somebody else so far ahead while you are exactly where you don't want to be. Now, let's continue, okay? Verse 3, the Bible says, His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. I mean, Joseph was in the worst possible dark place in his life, but his light shined so bright that people, pagan people, people who had no idea about the living God, they saw that the living God was with Joseph and the living God was responsible for the success Joseph is having. Do people see the living God in you? Because the same promise is extended to us today. God says, I will be with you always. I will never leave you nor forsake you. But see, church, our problem is that while God is with us, we're not with him. Because his presence is with us all the time. He is omnipresent. But the manifestation presence of God happens when you choose to step and enter into his presence. See, for fire to happen, the elements have to come together, right? This is science. When oxygen meets heat and fuel, fire happens. For the manifest presence of God to happen, you have to enter into his presence. And that's how fire happens, and the world is illuminated, and people see the light, and they glorify God. So here Joseph is. He went from being a favorite child. Now he's a slave, but he is killing it. He is being successful. People see God in him. 
And then something happens again. In verse 6, the Bible says Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Modern day terms, Joseph was a fine looking brother. <laughs> so Potiphar's wife starts checking him out. She had a thing for Joseph. I mean, who wouldn't? A fine looking, successful brother who glimmers with the presence of God? So, you know, one day she's like, Joseph, take off your jacket. He goes, man's not hot. <laughs> and then... This is what Joseph said. Okay, let's read. Verse 8. Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am. Nor has he kept back anything from me except... You, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? I mean, what a nice guy. Because if he was some of us, we block Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's wife blocked. But he was a gentleman. But see, Potiphar's wife didn't listen to his words. She was so thirsty, she kept on pressing in. She was savage. She was not a come get it if you want it type of chick. She was, I want it, I'm a come get it. <laughs> this is the kind of woman, as a man, you hope you don't cross paths with, you know? And all the men said, amen. amen. Now, but Joseph doesn't take this as an opportunity for elevation. Because if he finds favor in her lust, he'll be all right. But Joseph chose God's way. And instead of being rewarded for it, he gets punished for it. The wife starts rumors that Joseph wanted to rape her, so Joseph goes to jail. I mean, just imagine being him on that day. Like, I'm sure he started having hope that, you know what, I am killing it here. My master was a millionaire, now he's a billionaire because of me and the God's favor of my life. And now, I'm going to jail. So Joseph goes to jail. He just went from being a slave to a slave and a prisoner. But then something weird happens again. The Bible says that in prison, he finds favor in the prison guard. Everything he does prospers. And he is put in charge of the prison. I mean, doesn't this sound crazy to you? Because everywhere Joseph lands, he achieves the same results. Like he went from being a favorite child to being a slave to being a slave and a prisoner, but he achieved the same results. How do you have that level of consistency in your life? Because church, the truth is, our problem as Christians is not obeying God because we do sometimes. Our problem is not living a life worthy of our calling because we do sometimes. The problem is inconsistency. We are not consistent. We are like bitcoins, so volatile. <laughs> Circumstance change, we change with it. Obstacles change, we change with it. I mean, that's our problem, inconsistency. One day you are so in love with God, praying and reading the word, the next day you can't even make time to pray. One day you love so unconditionally like the Lord loved you, the next day they're not worthy of your love. One day you forgive so freely, as the Lord has forgiven you, the next day you're holding on to the hurt like it's a ticket to heaven. Consistency is our problem. You are celibate for like six months and then you go on a masturbation binge. You are sober for like four months and then you get wasted. You drink like, the bottle, like your life depends on the bottle. Consistency is our problem. So what did Joseph know? that led him to live such a life. I mean, he overcame temptation, he overcame compromise, he overcame apostasy, he overcame hopelessness. What did he know that led him to live such a life? The title of my message this morning is High Maintenance. I want you to say it out loud, High Maintenance. Say it again, High Maintenance. See, I believe that out of everything, Joseph knew that there is one thing that's high maintenance in this life. Joseph knew that there is one thing that he had to give that thing what it needs to live a consistent life. I, knew, I believe that Joseph knew that out of everything, there is one thing that's more demanding than anything else, and that's faith. Faith is high maintenance. Faith is demanding. Faith is hungry. Faith is like a newborn baby that consistently needs to be fed and consistently needs attention. And when you give faith what it needs, it gives you a consistent life. 
And when you deprive faith of what it needs, you will live a compromising and inconsistent life. So what is faith? Faith, simply put, is taking God at his word. Faith is believing that God is who he says he is, and he will do exactly what he says he will do. Hebrews 11.1 1 says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the substance of things not seen. You don't see it, but you know it is. It hasn't happened yet, but you know it will. That's faith. And to be consistent, you have to give faith what it needs. So what does faith need? Faith needs two things. One, to intimately know God. And two, to know what God says about every single situation. And this, church, will cost you a lot. To give faith what it needs will cost you a lot of attention. It will cost you a lot of time. It will require you to make sacrifices. Because, church, our problem is that we think faith is the easy part. Believe and you can move mountains, right? If you live a life of faith, you know it's not that easy, especially maintaining faith. Because let me tell you this, church, to process any kind of information, your brain burns energy, calories, any kind of information. And the simpler and the shallower the information, the less energy your brain needs to process that information. And the more complex and deep, the more energy it requires. That's why your brain will not debate you on whether or not it's worth it to listen to bubblegum pop music or trendy TV. It doesn't have to do any work. But nobody here studies geometry for fun because that requires a lot of energy to process. That's why your brain, in its default fallen nature, will always try to talk you out of reading the Bible because why burn so many calories trying to understand what Leviticus is talking about? But even in that state, your brain, once, it, once it's under, it, it understands that, you know what, this is worth doing, your brain does. That's why some people play Scrabble or, you know, crossword puzzles for fun. I, will, I, won't, I don't do that. Why waste those calories? You know what I'm saying? But when you truly understand, when you truly understand, truly convicted that your faith needs to intimately know God and your faith needs to know what God says about every single thing. When you truly understand that, and once you give it that, you will live a consistent life. Your brain, in its newly adapted nature, the renewed mind, will persuasively convince you that it is actually worth it to burn those calories, to make that sacrifice, to read the Word of God, and to spend time with God, because it knows that that sacrifice is worth it, because you will reap a consistent life and a prosperous life. See, I believe that Joseph knew that he had to hold on to faith, not only to survive, but to thrive. And this brings me to my main point today. And if you forget everything else that I'm saying today, I want you to remember this one thing. This is a view held by those who feed their faith. The people who consistently give their faith what it needs. And it serves as a reminder in the day of trouble, okay? So I want you to say this with me, church. Even now, God, you are who you say you are. Let's say it again. Even now, God, you are who you say you are. Let's say it again. Even now, God, you are who you say you are. I believe this is the view that Joseph held. Because when he was sold by his brothers as a slave, when he went to Egypt, he wasn't grumpy. He served. Because even in that moment, it's very easy to say, you know what? God, you have abandoned me. God, you have left me. But with the day that Potiphar's wife wanted to sleep with him, he said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Because in that moment, he knew that even now, even in the current circumstances, God is who he says he is. When he was sent to prison... Wrongly sent to prison by the guy who was supposed to be grateful that he chose not to sleep with his thirsty wife. When he was in prison, he wasn't grumpy. He didn't complain. He served. He was kind to everybody. And when the baker and the cup bearer came to him and said, we need a translation for this dream. Joseph said, don't translations belong to God? Because in that moment, he knew that even in this moment... I am in prison. God could have done something about this. Even in this moment, God is still true. God is still faithful. God will give you the translation. When he was in front of Pharaoh, after years in prison, 
You can lose your faith in that, in that kind of situation. But he was standing in front of Pharaoh and he said, God will give you a favorable answer. Because in that moment, Joseph knew that even now, God, you are who you say you are. Even now, God, you are who you say you are. So I don't know what's going on in your life, church. Maybe your marriage is on the rocks and you just have zero hope. I'm here to tell you that even now, God is who he says he is. Maybe you've lost your job and you can't seem to know how you're going to provide for your family. I am here to tell you that even now, God is who he says he is. Maybe you've been waiting for the one for the longest. I am here to tell you that even now, God is who he says he is. He is a healer. He is a comforter. He is a redeemer. He is a restorer. He loves you unconditionally. He is merciful and he is gracious. Even now, God is who he says he is. Because see, church, when we let go of our right view of God, we begin to compromise. Compromise begins with the wrong view of God. God, I'm pushing 40. And I'm still single. So you know what, God? Change your plans. Boaz can wait. I just need a sperm. God, I've been grinding at this business for years, doing it your way. Nothing has happened. So you know what, God? Change your plans. I'll start tithing to the guys given the jobs. It works for everybody else. God, I have been working so hard at this calling, reaping no fruits. So you know what, God? Change your plans. I'm all about that paper now. Compromise always begins with the wrong view of God. When you choose to deprive your faith of what it needs, you will live a compromising and an inconsistent life. When you choose to deprive your faith of what it needs, you will live a compromising and an inconsistent life. Just imagine with me, church. Imagine how different your life would be if you were consistent. Imagine how different your marriage will be if you consistently loved each other. Imagine how different your world would be like if you consistently served other people. If you, consistent, if you were consistently faithful with your finances, how different will your life be like? How different will it, your life be like if you consistently walked in God's perfect will? How good of a father will you be? How good of a mom will you be? How good of a wife or a husband will you be? How good of a friend, how good of a leader, how good of an employee will you be? So I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, say it like you mean it, neighbor, neighbor. your faith is hungry. And if you starve it, you ain't going to be consistent. Now turn to your other neighbor. Say, neighbor, your faith is hungry. And if you starve it, you ain't going to be consistent. Because I tell you this, church, God has said something about your current situation in his word. God has said something about your future situation in his word. Hold on to the right view of God. Take him at his word. We have to stop treating faith like it's a camel. Feed it once, survive for a month. If you only feed your faith Sunday to Sunday, connect group to connect group, devotional to devotional, you are slipping. It's not going to end well for you. And some of you already know what I'm talking about. Because you are living an inconsistent life. Faith is high maintenance. And when you give faith what it needs, it gives you a consistent life. Consistency is a fruit. It's like what Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branch. You can do nothing apart from me. You can't produce fruit on your own unless you're attached to Jesus. And you can't have an inconsistent life unless you give your faith what it needs. That's how it works. So when you are inconsistent, don't be so shocked. It's like walking home and finding your child skinny and dying. When you starve that child for two months, and you're like, what happened? What do you mean what happened? He was supposed to be chubby from starvation? It doesn't work like that. So church, I want you to say with this with me one more time, okay? And this time around, say it like your life depends on it. Because there will come a day when your life depends on it. There will come a day when you are tempted to compromise. There will come a day when you're tempted to give up. There will come a day when you're tempted to quit. And for some of you, that day is today. So I want you to say this with me one more time, okay? Even now, God... You are, you are who you say you are. You say you are. 
Say it again. Even now, God, you are who you say you are. Say it one more time. Even now, God, you are who you say you are. I want you to remember this, the day you were sitting at home and horny, and you're thinking of getting that lubricant of that vibrator. Now, no need to get awkward, because this is real life. Real life is not cute. It's not a Disney movie. It's ugly. And if you came to church hoping for a cute sermon, you came on the wrong day. When that day comes, I want you to remember that even now, God, you are who you say you are. I am better than this. You have set me apart. You have called me to live a righteous life. The day that you are in a room and somebody's undressing that's not your spouse, I want you to say this. Even now, God, you are who you say you are. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against you, God? The day you are living such a busy life and you are compromising your personal time with God, I want you to say this. Even now, God, you are who you say you are. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of your mouth, God. He who delights in your word is like a tree planted next to a stream. It shall bear fruit in every season, and everything that person does shall prosper. Even now, God, you are who you say you are. Even now, God, you are who you say you are. Even now, God, you are who you say you are. The day there is a temptation to compromise, to quit, to let go, I want you to say it out loud. Say it scared. Say it crying. Say it with joy. Say it with laughter. Even now, God, you are who you say you are. Even now, God, you are who you say you are. Church, stand with me. Like I said, I don't really know what's going on in your life. I don't know which season of life you're in. But I'm here to tell you that God is still faithful. God is still true. Even if it seems like it's not going to work out, it will. Because he's still in charge. God has never slipped. He won't start with you. God is still faithful. God is still faithful. I want you to remember this, church, that even now, God is who he says he is. Even though there is no light at the end of the tunnel, God is who he says he is. Let's pray. King Almighty, we come before you this morning, God, and we say thank you for your faithfulness. We say thank you that, Father, you chose to encourage us this morning, Lord Jesus. I say thank you for everybody who's in this room, Lord Jesus, God. You know what they're going through, Lord. You know what they're going through, Lord. And I know you've encouraged somebody this morning, Lord Jesus, God. So I pray that, Father, whatever they have received, God, may it produce fruit in their lives, Lord Jesus. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would remind us when we encounter the darkest moment, that even in that moment, you are still faithful. Even in that moment, you are who you say you are. Even in that moment, you are still working for our good, Lord Jesus. I say thank you because, Father, we will walk out of this place transformed. I say thank you, Father, because, Father, we know that your word doesn't go out void, God, and comes out with nothing, God. When your, void, when, your, when your word comes out, Lord Jesus, God, it produces fruit, Lord Jesus, God. So I rejoice and celebrate because I know that, Father, the devil has failed, Lord Jesus, God. We will be encouraged. We will be encouraged, Lord Jesus, because your spirit is at work in us. And he will remind us that even in the worst and the darkest of moments, you are still faithful and you are who you say you are. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.